Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. This series was made possible in part through the generosity of Alexion, and we thank them for their support. My name is Melanie Paris, and I'm Senior Director of Health Initiatives and Education here at the American Kidney Fund. Before I turn the presentation over to today's speaker, I'd like to direct your attention to the control panel you should see on your screen. All participants are on mute, so we won't hear you, but we welcome your questions. If you have a question, please type it into the section of your control panel titled Questions. We'll see your questions and we'll do our best to answer them, either by replying to you in the questions box or out loud during the last several minutes of the presentation. This webinar is being recorded and will be made available for viewing on our website, kidneyfund.org slash webinars, within the next one to two weeks. For those of you in attendance who are health professionals, we're glad that you've joined us today and hope you'll recommend this webinar to your patients you work with. However, as a friendly reminder, this webinar is not accredited for continuing education credit. If you believe that your accrediting body may offer you credits for attending this webinar, we'll be happy to send you a certificate of attendance after today's session. Simply email us at education slash kidneyfunds.org. Without further ado, let me introduce today's speakers, Angeles Herrera and Holly Bodhi. Angeles was born in Managua, Nicaragua, and currently lives in San Francisco, California. Angeles has served, suffered from kidney disease all her life. Throughout her life, she has considered herself very blessed and takes whatever victory she can. She uses her blessings to better the lives of those in her community and beyond. She's very engaged in advocating for her end-stage renal disease peers. She assists the American Kidney Fund and other renal groups by sharing her story and raising awareness. Holly Bodie is the Vice President of Government Affairs at the American Kidney Fund. Before coming to AKF, she volunteered or she worked at the Alliance of Community Health Plans, where she led their federal lobbying and communications effort for nearly five years with a focus on Medicare Advantage and other health plan issues. Holly also worked on Capitol Hill for over nine years for various members of the U.S. Senate and House of Representatives as well as five years at the Department of Health and Human Services under Secretary Donna Shalila. Thank you, Angelis and Holly, for joining us. Thank you, Melanie. Hi, everybody. This is Holly Bodie from AKF. I'm going to start the webinar and talk a little bit about advocacy, and then we will um, have a question and answer period with Angelis. So at the American Kidney Fund, um, we are focused on, on three things, I think, this year and, and moving into the future, empowering our patients, fighting kidney disease, and honoring patients and advocates on, who are focused on fighting kidney disease. AKS is a strong voice for kidney patients. We work with our patient advocates almost every day, and they're at the heart of what we do and the stories that we share with um, people on Capitol Hill people in state legislatures, and um, really people all over the country who are interested in kidney disease. Um, there are a variety of things that we do with our patients. One of the things we do annually is a, our patient fly-in. Every spring, we bring about 20 or 30 patients to D.C. to teach them how to be good advocates and then take them up to Capitol Hill to talk to their members of Congress about what it means to be a kidney patient. Um, we have probably about 10,000 advocates right now, but our most engaged and active advocates are um, people we call our state leaders program. Um, they receive training and can conduct in-district meetings with federal and state officials on their own. So uh, we have a lot of different things we do for advocates, and if you're interested in getting engaged uh, more with AKF, there are a variety of ways through our Facebook page and um, on our website. So just please uh, let us know if you're interested in getting more information. So advocacy, how do you, how do you as a patient, how do you fit in? So we're going to talk about three things, or I'm going to talk about three things today. That is understanding advocacy, how to communicate with Congress, and what is grassroots advocacy. So what is advocacy exactly? It's organized activity with the purpose of influencing legislation and public policy. 
communications and activities that educate Congress and decision makers and the public is also advocacy. Communications and activities that build public support for programs and funding for kidney disease treatment, prevention, and education is also advocacy. Advocacy means influencing people, policies, and systems. It means lobbying, mobilizing, educating, and networking. Advocacy can be done on your own. It can be done with a group of like-minded people or with a coalition of organizations. Advocacy can be aimed at immediate results or a long-term goal. It holds people in power responsible for the decisions that they make and for engaging with their constituents. It also empowers individuals to speak up for themselves. Today, we're focused on lobbying at the federal level, but there are also opportunities at the local and state levels to advocate. And it's important to keep in mind that people, elected officials, and other decision makers at the local and state level often end up at the federal level in Congress and sometimes even in the White House. So why should you advocate? Advocacy helps develop individuals as promoters of change. Um, advocates can speak for people who cannot speak for themselves. Um, many of our advocates here at AKF are really driven by the need and by the desire to speak for kidney patients, other kidney patients who are too sick or too frail to speak for themselves. It also creates more resources for kidney patients and changes power structures and systems to increase support for those with chronic kidney disease and those on dialysis. Advocacy is really at the heart of our representative democracy because it relies on the relationship between everyday citizens and their legislators. So why should you advocate? Well, decisions are going to be made regardless of who participates in the process. And so the more you participate, the more influence you can have over the decision. Your personal experience and expertise can enhance these decisions that are made at the local, state, and national levels. As a patient advocate, you really have an important and unique story to tell. Sharing your experience can be very powerful to you and the person to whom you're speaking and can help decision makers learn about issues. Legislators make their decisions, they can make their decisions based on your experiences, and that's why they need to hear from you. Advocates can influence policy outcomes and help pass changes in laws and policies that improve kidney health. So how do you communicate? What's the best way to communicate with Congress? Uh, three ways that um, are typically used are email, Facebook, and Twitter. You'll note that there is uh, nothing in here about sending letters to Congress. And while you can certainly send letters through snail mail to Congress, there is an elaborate system of um, screening those letters that ultimately takes uh, at least two or three weeks for mail to actually get to Capitol Hill. So it really is best to focus on more electronic technologies to get your messages up to members of Congress and their staff. Other ways to communicate with Congress is personal contact at meetings or at town halls. Many members of Congress have town halls, you know, a couple of times a year. Sometimes they focus on certain issues like healthcare, and sometimes they're more a general um, gathering of people to talk about issues. Phone calls are also another way that you can communicate with members of Congress, um, especially when there's a, a bill on the floor that a lot of people care about. Members will get thousands of phone calls a day, and they actually do have an impact on how people um, vote. Hill Lobby Day. So if, as I mentioned earlier, AKF hosts a lobby day every spring where we bring in several, uh, 20 or 30 of our patients. And that's a really effective way. Um, you're part of a larger group. You're able to get training. Um, you're able to engage with other people who are in the same situation, who have the same experiences as you. So that can be a very powerful um, way to, to communicate. Also, as individual letters are on here, um, and again, you can certainly send letters, but I think electronic communication, the way Congress works now, is probably the most effective way to do this. So how, what are the strategy around advocating? So one of the things you have to do to be a good advocate is figure out the pressure point. 
And by pressure points, I mean critical points in people in the legislative process that may increase or enhance your success or slow down your success. So there are, there are things that you can influence for good or um, to make things happen, or you can also influence things to make things slow down. Um, chairmen and members of important congressional committees are our key pressure points. So for example, the chairman of what they call the House Ways and Means Committee, they have jurisdiction over Medicare. Um, Medicare is an important payer for kidney patients. So chairman and members of the House Ways and Means Committee are very important pressure points. Um, other political leaders, such as the uh, members who control their party's agenda. So for example, that would be another example of that is House Speaker Paul Ryan or um, Majority Leader uh, Mitch McConnell in the Senate. So um, members of both parties in the leadership positions determine the party's agenda. Another um, area of pressure point are these uh, things we call markups. Markups are when a bill comes before a committee and the committee takes that bill under consideration and they mark it up, meaning that they make changes and amendments to the bill. And then once the bill is marked up, it's then sent to the floor. Um, so there are four votes in the House and the Senate. Once a bill is passed, the House and the Senate come together to decide what the final bill will look like. And then once that's voted on, it is sent to the president who either signs the bill or vetoes the bill. And in most cases, the president will sign the bill because as this process goes on, it's worked from start to finish very closely with the administration. Another part of strategy is understanding a legislator's critical interests. So how do you figure out what their interests are? There are a variety of things you can do. You can um, determine what legislation they have supported in the past. What industries or interests are prevalent in their districts or their geography? So for example, a member from New York City is probably not going to have a lot of interest in agricultural issues. And a member from a very rural area is probably not going to be that concerned with, say, mass transit. So, you know, where a patient or where a member of Congress lives often has a strong relationship to the in, to issues that they are interested in. But I will add that every single member of Congress cares about health care um, because every single person in their district generally has health care needs and issues, and it's the, it's the rare person that doesn't have some interest in health care. Another way that members can get engaged is do they have a personal interest in an issue. So for example, maybe they have a relative that has kidney disease, or maybe in some cases, um, some members of Congress have actually donated a kidney to a, a relative or friend. So there are other ways that members um, engage in personal issues. The same um, is true of their top legislative aides. Um, sometimes they have an individual experience or personal experience with a disease that will engage them in the issue. So how do you do a meeting with a legislator? There are a few things to keep in mind. First of all, be on time and be polite. Be flexible. This is probably one of the most important things when you go into a meeting with a member of Congress or his or her staff. Sometimes meetings don't start on time. Sometimes meetings happen out in the hallway. Sometimes you think a meeting is going to be half an hour long and it's five or 10 minutes long. So being flexible is really important. Um, keep your introductions short, be direct, brief, and stay on message. I think it's also important to practice before you go into a meeting, practice how you're going to tell your story, practice how you're going to engage with the staff member or the member of Congress. Summarize what you want in advance, listen and localize what you're talking about. And then again, to the practice, agree in advance who will speak and then Make sure you follow up. That's almost uh, one of the most important things you can do. Members of Congress and their staff have, I think it's not an exaggeration to say hundreds of meetings a year. Following up can set you apart from other meetings. So how do you make your case? Define the problem in terms that make it appear manageable. So what that means is don't go in and say, well, the only way you can solve the issue I'm bringing before you today is to spend $200 million on it. That doesn't necessarily make it appear manageable. I think initially it's good to go in and just tell your personal story 
and talk about things that can be done on a smaller scale that can make this issue better for you and people in your situation. So provide data from the state and the district. So for example, provide data on how many people in the member's district or state have kidney disease, how many are on dialysis, how many have the same disease that you have. State your facts in brief bulleted messages. Again, it's very important to be succinct and brief. Um, economic case examples are often very compelling to members of Congress. Um, if you say fixing X problem saves X amount of money, that is a very compelling argument. Um, appeal to congressional precedents, that means you could say, well, you know, the Congress three years ago addressed this issue by doing this, and they can address the issue again this year by doing the same thing. So that's a way to appeal to congressional precedents. Again, tell your story. I think there's no substitute for a member or their staff hearing a personal story. Make a specific request for action and make education of elected officials a continuous and ongoing process. Again, following up, being in regular touch is really, really important. It helps to get your issue to the front of the queue when there are so many issues that are fighting for space and attention. Meetings in congressional districts are often easier to schedule and attend than meetings in Washington, D.C. Members are often home on the weekends. There is usually a congressional recess every month or every other month where they are in their district for at least a week. Um, in August, they're usually home for a month. Um, this year, the House will be home for a month. The Senate will only be home for a week. Um, but congressional recesses are very uh, much easier times to get meetings with members oftentimes. And it's also easy to build working relationships with staff in the district offices because they, one of their primary reasons for working for that member is to really build strong relationships with their local constituents. And it's also easy to bring others representing your same interests to the meeting. So what are grassroots activities that you can do? Um, you can go, there are site visits. So many members of Congress, for example, will go to a community health center, go to an ESRD clinic. Um, there are award ceremonies for members of Congress, recognition events with legislators, um, press conferences. You know, oftentimes members will have press conferences that are open to the public. Um, Issues and policy forums, that's something that uh, people can organize and invite legislators and community leaders to attend and participate in. You can organize a call-in or email campaign or attend a Capitol Hill Day. So there are a variety of ways at the grassroots level that um, patients can engage with their members outside of um, attending meetings or town halls with their member of Congress. Other examples include telling real life stories. Um, again, just going back to the importance of telling your story, there's really nothing more important than your own personal experience when you talk to members of Congress and other opinion leaders. Um, developing fact sheets and background papers, that's something we do here at AKF all the time. It's important, you know, in a meeting, sometimes you can't get everything across. Or like I said, people have, you know, 10 meetings a day. It's important to have something written down on paper that they can refer back to that's written succinctly and puts your issues, you know, very, again, very succinctly and in a way that's easy to read and remember. Um, online petitions are another way. Um, Change.org, for example, comes to mind. Um, it's, you can build your base of advocates and they can, those things, members of Congress pay attention to those. And finally, coalitions. So, um, there may be other organizations in your community that also care about, say, for example, access to health care or affordability. So this year is an election year. Every two years there is an election. Um, the whole House um, is voted on every two years. And members of the Senate are um, elected every six years. So every two years, one-third of the Senate is up for re-election, if that makes sense. Um, so. What are election year activities? Well, during an election year, there are generally way more face-to-face -face events that members have. They have debates, they have town halls, they have press conferences. Um, that's an important way that um, you can get involved at, in, during an election year. Um, you can use visuals such as signs, stickers, fact sheets at these events. Um, arrive early for opportunity to talk with press and candidates. Candidates come to these events to talk to their constituents and they really are interested and talking to their constituents. So it's important to make yourself available and to present yourself 
to talk to the members of Congress and other candidates. Other activities include, as I mentioned earlier, um, petitions, voter education and registration, volunteering at polling places, et cetera, et cetera. So now I'm going to do a quick rundown of the legislative process as it happens on at the federal level. So as I mentioned earlier, there are congressional committees that, that, that determine how a bill moves forward. There are major categories of bills and then where bills come from. So how does a bill become law? Legislation is introduced, and then they have generally, there'll be a subcommittee or full committee hearing, and then as I mentioned earlier, a markup where the bill is considered and amended. Then the bill is sent to the floor and voted on by the House and or the Senate. A conference committee comes together to resolve the differences between the House and Senate version, and then there's presidential action. This is how generally things are supposed to go through the process, it's not always how it goes. Um, sometimes they will skip the conference committee. Um, sometimes a bill will actually only pass the Senate and not the House. It has to pass both chambers in order to be sent to the president. So that's often sort of a, a roadblock to legislation is there could be support, strong support in either the House or the Senate. It passes the House or the Senate, but it doesn't make it to the other side of the Capitol. And so that can be a real, um, that can be a block in, in moving legislation forward. There are 19 committees in the House, 17 in the Senate. Hundreds and hundreds of bills are introduced to every Congress, and a very small number of them actually move forward for consideration. Much of the work around legislation is done by the staff. Um, members of Congress are pulled in a million different directions, and so the staff does most of the work. And so the staff are really the ones that are the most important people to get to know, because they're the ones doing the day-to-day -day work on much of this legislation. So the committees that are important to kidney health in the House are appropriations, energy and commerce, and ways and means, among others. And in the Senate, it's primarily the Finance Committee and the Health Committee. So there are major categories of bills. There are budget bills that suggest levels of spending, authorization bills, they establish policies and recommend levels of spending. And then appropriations bills actually create the spending and actually provide the dollars that can be spent on programs. There are various um, sources of federal legislation. Congress on um, the executive branch puts forth um, bills. Private businesses sometimes put forth bills to get um, support from Congress. Individuals can put forth bills um, that members can be interested in. And then these bills can be introduced anytime during a two-year Congress. So right now we're in the second half of a Congress, are the current Congress, which is the 115th Congress, will end um, in December, and a new Congress will be sworn in in January of 2019. So in conclusion, I just want to say that you can be the person who sparks an next piece of legislation that improves the lives of kidney patients. One person really can make a difference. And just to quote Margaret Mead, an American anthropologist, a small group of thoughtful people can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. So now I'm going to turn it over to Angeles, who can tell us a little bit about herself and her journey with kidney disease. Thank you, Holly. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for taking time of your busy time to listen to your um, to this webinar. Um, I am very happy to be here today, and I hope that you're, you find my experience helpful in your journey dealing with and or advocating for kidney patients. Um, again, I'm Angeles Herrera, and I was born and raised in Nicaragua, but I'm very fortunate to live in San Francisco for the past 35 years. Um, I was a teen single mom, and today I'm proud to be the mother of a 30-year-old um, young man. I'm very passionate about kidney disease since they have been part of my life, um, my entire life. And, um, and I hope that um, this time that we're spending together uh, will be useful um, in your journey. So can you tell us about your experience with kidney disease? Um, sure. So as I mentioned, I've been living with kidney disease my entire life. When I was about 
um, two and a half years old, I had an acute kidney failure. Uh, my parents um, at that time didn't know what was going on with me. They just noticed that I was um, getting more and more sick and um, I was pretty um, swollen and they have uh, mortgaged their life to bring me to the specialist back home and the specialist did not have the the um, information or the the skills to deal with what was happening with me. So it was recommended to them that um, they take me to Mexico. Uh, they did an open biopsy in Mexico and they found out that I had lupus in my kidneys and uh, that unless I had a kidney transplant, most likely I was going to die. Um, we came back home and um, not really quite sure how, one of my kidneys began to work. They call me the miracle girl in my neighborhood. Um, my left kidney began to work and I was um, able to be, um, to continue my life into my la late um, 20s where I was diagnosed with um, a rare kidney disease called IgA nephropathy which is also known as Berger's disease. Um, and um, I, I lived through that disease for a while. And then when I turned 80, I mean 35, it's when I went to kidney failure and had to go through dialysis for a couple of years. And then I was fortunate enough, another miracle occurred and I, was, um, I received a kidney transplant and um, that was 11 years ago. So I, um, Kidney disease has been part of my entire life. Thank you. Do you know how many people your um, Berger's disease affects in the United States? Yeah, I, I think it's about 130,000 people um, every year in the United States. Um, it's, um, it's definitely um, a small percentage of, of patients that go through kidney disease. Um, and it usually occurs in adolescents and young adults between the age of 15 and 35, which is, it, it, it matches um, my experience. So I'd like to ask you a couple questions now on the way about advocacy. So when you advocate, do you see yourself as part of the kidney disease community or the burgers community? I see myself as part of both communities and many others. I'm part of the community of people that have suffered significant health issues and um, that life has not been uh, ever taken for granted because um, you never know when the next shoe is going to fall. So, um, and I, so I think advocacy it has been part of my life um, in many different ways. Um, I think that I'm that advocacy, we're all advocacy for ourselves. Uh, when I went through kidney failure as a young adult, I had to become my number one advocate. Um, I had to, for example, when I needed to decide what kind of um, dialysis I was going to go through, I visited all the different dialysis centers, I educated myself, I, I, I tried to learn as much as possible about my disease and, um, and try to figure out what was the best way to ha go through dialysis and maintain the, the parts of my life that I enjoy the most. So I chose to do peritoneal dialysis because I chose to be my own nurse. Um, now that I have my kidney transplant, I have to go get my, my labs done on a monthly basis. I, take, um, I pay attention to those results very quickly. If I see something that it doesn't add up, I immediately call the doctor. I immediately request, what are we going to do about this medicine? Why is this number low? Why is this number too high? Um, get up in the morning and make sure that I follow all the instructions, take my meds, um, have my rest, take, put my sunblock, I, absolutely everything that I get asked to do, um, I have to do it. Um, so I think that we are our number one advocate. Um, now, in terms of um, helping our community. Um, I think it is important for us to work together, um, especially when we have, when we're experiencing a rare disease. I, we, there's the saying that the squiggly wheel always 
um, gets the attention. I think that the smaller the group it is, the louder we need to um, support each other and voice our concerns so that um, our legislators can pay attention to us and can um, uh, make sure that they represent us and put the fund in the right places. Great, thank you. So it sounds like you incorporate advocacy in, in every aspect of your life. So can you tell Absolutely. us um, um, what, what makes a rare disease rare and, and how is a rare disease defined? So a rare disease is based on the numbers in the United States. So um, in the United States, the way we defined a rare disease, if it impacts fewer than 200,000 people. And I, as I mentioned, um, right now, there's about 130,000 people that get impacted by uh, Berger's disease every year. And I, I believe this definition was created by Congress. Congress created what's called the Orphan Drug Act of 1983. And the reason they created this act is to um, provide funding. Um, the Drug Administration and just medicine in general tends to go to um, the, the diseases that impact the largest amount of patients. And um, definitely, uh, Berger's disease does not fall into that category. So the act was created to create financial incentives to encourage companies to develop new drugs for rare diseases. So um, that's, that's how it's defined and the purpose of the definition. Thank you. So I think you answered this question in large part already, but is there anything else you'd like to add about how advocacy is part of your dealing with your disease? Well, I talked about how, I, how we have to advocate for ourselves, but I actually like to talk more about how um, it makes me feel when I'm actually advocating um, for, for my entire community. So um, I, I advocate for many reasons. One of them is one of the best benefits of advocacy is that I have met um, amazing people through the journey. It is incredible how dialysis and rare kidney disease can make you often feel lonely and different and, um, and leaves you with a lot of unanswered uh, questions like, why me? What could I have done differently? Um, why is this happening? And, um, and often you kind of feel strange, like you don't fit anywhere. But then when I'm around people advocating for our causes, it is incredible to see the energy, the passion, and the support that, that I have found through advocacy. Um, I do lots of different um, activities when I do the kidney walk. I also do um, a relay um, here in California. And um, when I'm running or when I'm walking, I'm not just benefiting my health by, um, by, by being active and exercising, but I'm just, I, I just feel alive. And sometimes I feel um, invincible when, when, when I come um, together with people that share the same passion and, um, and that we make a big difference. When, when I'm sitting across the table from a legislator or, or a staffer, and I'm sharing my experience, and they never even heard of the disease. They never even heard of, of, of um, kidney uh, failure. And I see their faces light up, and I see their willingness to, um, to support and listening to me. I kind of feel like I give a face to our disease, and that makes me feel very happy, and I'm probably the one that benefits the most from my advocacy work. Thank you. That's, that's very inspirational. And I, and I know that a, a number of our patients that we work with feel the same way, that they feel it's, it's very empowering to be part of a group that feels the same way that you do. And it's, it's very empowering to tell your story, like you said, to legislators and decision makers who maybe have never, ever met anyone with kidney disease or kidney failure before. So why do you think advocacy is particularly important for people with rare diseases? Again, the smaller the group, the louder we have to be. Um, I think that um, we need to make sure that uh, we get the same healthcare options that everyone else does. Um, because we're a smaller group, it doesn't mean that our lives are not equally important. 
I think that we need to make sure that uh, drug development and clinical trials are happening. Uh, we need to make sure that our insurance coverage for drugs and therapy continues. We need to bring awareness um, um, just to for for lots in, in lots of different ways for for people's sensitivity. A lot of times people put us in boxes like, well, you're not sick because you're young, or you're not sick because of this, because they, they, there's not a lot of information out there um, about kidney disease. Um, I really think that we need to continue to fight so that more research happens and uh, more prevention um, can occur. And again, support one another. Um, your family, your friends can help you, can be there for you, but nobody understands um, what we're going through better than ourselves. Yeah, absolutely. So what do you wish people knew about the rare disease community? Um, I love people to know that we were, we're not rare in the sense that we were very passionate. We, we have a, a, a lot of energy. Um, sometimes we may feel fatigued. Sometimes we may feel um, lonely. Sometimes we may feel that there is something wrong with us and that, um, and that um, our future is very uncertain. And um, I think it's important to um, be sensitive to those days. And um, just like any other minority group, um, I think that we need to continue um, to, to fight for ourselves, to support each other, and um, and, and to bring awareness to our um, legislators and the political um, seers in our in our district, in our state, in our in, in our county, to make sure that we get the proper um, health care that we need. Thank you. So I think all of us who work in, in kidney disease know that it's sometimes difficult to find members of Congress and other elected officials to know about kidney disease and to understand what it means for a patient. Do you find it to be even more difficult to find people who understand your rare disease? Absolutely. I actually been surprised on how little our elected officials know or their staff about kidney disease and I have talked to maybe a dozen of them um, so far, and I don't think any of them um, have ever heard of um, kidney disease like Berger's, like the one I have. They they had no idea. But I also been very surprised that everyone that I speak to has the um, they they have listened to me um, very careful, and they seem to be very engaged. They have asked a lot of questions. Um, and um, they have been very open to what I have to say and, um, and have been uh, taking my request um, seriously. Good, good. I'm glad you've had that experience. So how do you find other patients with a rare disease or with your rare disease? Well, through advocacy, I have to say that before um, I, that the first time I learned um, about someone else who, who had suffered from uh, Bercher's disease was when I came for the fly-in um, uh, that the American Kidney Fund um, um, allowed me to participate on um, early um, last spring. Um, so. Um, I think advocacy is a great support system. Um, I, I was in, um, when I was in dialysis, there were about 60 folks um, in my dialysis center, and, um, and, and nobody was there from, um, as a result of Berger's disease. So um, I know that it is a small group. I think there were like 35 of us that participating on the fly-in, and I think there were only two of us who had that disease. So um, it's definitely a smaller group, but if you do um, some internet research um, and um, and you join um, advocacy organizations, um, um, many there there are a lot of small ones in 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 different cities, 
and there's also some national ones. Um, you, um, you know, use uh, social media, for example. I have um, met um, a lot of people through social media, through the different um, organizations that help um, uh, kidney disease patients. Great. No, those are those are great suggestions. Thank you. So, what challenges do you find to be specific to rare diseases when it comes to advocacy? Um, educate the lack of awareness, the lack of education. Um, it's it's a silent disease, um, and um, many people don't know that they have the disease until until they go into kidney failure. So um so it's it's really it, it's it's challenging to know um um to know a lot of the information about it. And because of that, um it seems like there's less and, and because of the smaller number it seems to be less funding and research available for preventing it or for curing it. Um, so it doesn't seem like we get our fair share of research funding, and because of that, I think it's um, it's really important to um, build some extra time to explain to folks uh, that kidney disease they're multiple and there are some rare um, diseases that impact a smaller group of people, um, and, and and it's something that people are. That, they just don't talk about it. So we need to give a voice and a face and share a story so that it becomes, so we we stop being looked at the rare disease and more um, as a group of people that need and deserve the same attention as anyone else. Great, thank you. So finally, um, I think that for you know many people, the, the idea of becoming an advocate can be somewhat daunting um, and so do you have any advice on overcoming challenges to becoming an advocate? Uh, absolutely. I would say start small. Um, you know, I have a, a, a full life. I have a full-time job. I, and, and I don't have as much time as I wish I did um, to advocate. Um, so I, I, I have started with small steps. Um, I, I, I first started with a local organization here in the Bay Area and um, doing um, a kidney run. And, um, and now I, I, I've been surprised on how, how much advocacy I, I, I've been doing because, you know, the more you do it, the more you like it. Um, but I, I will say start small. You don't have to jump into um, doing something that you're not comfortable with. But I, I was surprised myself of how comfortable I have become and how much I have enjoyed it. Um, I was a little hesitant um, uh, at the beginning because of the timing, because uh, um, also, I, I, I'm, believe it or not, sometimes I can be shy and I did not want it to become a public person per se. Um, but um, I have discovered through advocacy that um, it is important to give a voice and that it actually makes me feel alive when I share my story. And um, so because I'm benefiting so much from it emotionally and, and also just fulfilling uh, that need to feel um, useful. And um, even when I'm not here, I feel like if I'm advocating um, and my advocacy helps in any way, um, someone else in future generations not to have to go through what I'm going through. I'm going to feel like I'm, I'm, it was all worth it. So it gives me a mission um, and that it has overpowered my fears uh, before I started advocating. Thank you so much for that. You you really are an inspiration and I, and I want to say, um, you know, you in a short period of time working with us here at AKF, have become really one of our, our best advocates and, and we appreciate everything that, that you do for, for us and for other patients. So with that, um, I'm going to turn it back over to Melanie. Thank you again, uh, Angeles and Holly, 
um, for leading and just having such an excellent webinar. Um, at this time, I'd like to you know pose a few questions. Um, so let's see. Let me just get right to it. Um, one question is, how do you get elected officials to care about something affecting such a small group of people, like a rare disease? Do you ever have to broaden the topic to make it more relatable? So what I've learned is that um, local officials are, are, are really interested in hearing what their constituents have to say. And um, I, I, because they depend on their votes. And um, I, I have found that when I have talked to them, and I, uh, I, I think that it was a, a good introduction of the webinar, we say, you know, be concise, make sure that you have clear um, um, definition of what you're there for. I have found that when I say, I live in your district and I am here to request that you do X, they automatically listen. They, they pay attention and, um, and you have to kind of like hold them responsible for representing you. Um, so sometimes you have to be a little direct and, um, and, and, and I, um, after you go through the educational portion of it, because like I said, many of the staffers that I have talked to never heard of some of them not even kidney disease and, and others not, I mean, let alone um, Berger's disease. So you have to take a little bit more time to um, educate yourself so that you can share those facts with them. Um, but then after that, hold them responsible for exactly what you're asking. Okay. Um, did you get your family involved in advocacy too? And if you did, how did you do it? They're starting to. Um, I think I mentioned that I was a little shy myself and um, it took me a little while. So they are um, participating now in some of the walks with me and some of the runs. But um, um, I, they have also um, signed out petitions. Like recently, there's the bill that's been introduced here in California that will have an adverse impact on kidney disease patients. So I send that um, information and requested that they all sign the petition and contact their local officials um, to prevent this from happening. So I have to kind of do a little education within my, my own family and group of friends and, um, and share um, what I need from them. Okay, thank you. Um, another one is kind of the time um, that you take to you know, engage in advocacy. So about how much time does that take and how do you balance the advocacy work that you do with your personal and professional life? Like how do you manage all of those things? I actually find my advocacy work as a, as a treat. So um, I, I spend some of my um, vacation time doing advocacy, um, uh, my weekends, my evening work. For example, I took a couple of hours of vacation time from work this morning to participate on this webinar. Um, but it, it actually works out really well for me because I have a pretty demanding and stressful job. So I did some work in the morning and I'm doing this webinar and I'm going back to work right after. So um, I think it actually um, creates a balance in my life and it makes the quality of my life better. Um, and, and I look forward to doing it. So to me, I don't find it um, as difficult as I thought I would um, because I enjoy it. Okay. Um, do you have any suggestions for just rare disease groups that you'd suggest people join? Um, I just recently um, did a research and um, I found that here through or the um, University of San Francisco, they have a, 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 a group for specifically for Berger's disease that I, I plan to join. I actually have not joined them in the past. Um, so I will just say that um, 
use the information that's out there. Um, social media um, is, a, is a big part of it. But also, when you, if, if you go to a dialysis center or, um, or your nephrology's office, are great places to, uh, for recommendations on support groups uh, with folks with similar disease. So, Andalay, this is Holly. I'm curious, you talked about, you know, that there were some, some obstacles maybe that you had to, to getting engaged, and I'm curious, what's the biggest obstacle that you had to overcome, and how did you overcome it? Well, to be frank, the biggest obstacle is actually acceptance of your own self. I, I try to be uh, very uh, self-sufficient and independent and uh, when you advocate and you share your story you kind of become a little vulnerable um, and you know to accept that you're a part of um, a group that is, is suffering from from health issues um, that we don't have a hundred percent health like what most people in you see on the street may believe um, what's what's a challenge um, so it it was more it was more mental for me. Like, do I really want to be put myself in this box and kind of like, you know, get out in the public and say, yes, I suffer from kidney diseases. Um, but I didn't realize how much support and how much healthier I feel when I advocate. Um, it had actually the opposite effect on me. Thank you. So um, I have a question for Holly. So working so closely with senators and representatives and working with nonprofit or working for nonprofit organization like you do now, I mean, what, what makes a really good advocate? What helps, what are the qualities that help you do your job better? Some people may think, well, I'm not, you know, um, you know, professional or something. Maybe I don't have enough knowledge. I mean, what are those qualities that make an advocate effective? So I think there are a couple of things that make people effective advocates, and, and one of them is just having the desire to be an advocate. I think um, you can hear from Annalise that she's just very driven by this need to need and desire to tell her story and to help other patients. And so I think, first of all, you just you have to, to want to do it. And I think there certainly for most people, I mean, I, this is my career, so I'm used to going up on Capitol Hill and talking to people, but for many people, I know it can seem very daunting. And so I think um, a great way to, to get engaged and a great way to, to become a good advocate is to, like Anjali said, start small. So go with a group of people, so it's not just you. Um, or go talk to a local official, so the, the stakes are a little bit lower, perhaps. I think it's also important um, to, to practice telling your story. I think when we bring advocates in and, and we train them, I think at first many people have the reaction of like, well, I don't really have a story to tell. What am I going to say? And then once you know, everybody gets together and shares their stories, I think it really inspires people. And I think everyone has a story that they can tell that will resonate with elected officials. And I think it's just a question of really practicing it and, and maybe sitting down with others who share your experiences and, and learning from, from each other. And so I think, you know, those things of, of just wanting to be an advocate, being motivated, you know, sort of facing some of your fears and then just basic practice. You know, I think those are the things that, that make good advocates. So if someone wanted to be an advocate with an organization, do you help them practice their story? Do you kind of prep them and get them ready? Yes, yes. So for example, when people um, come and participate in our fly-in that we do every year, we have a, a, a very full day of training on how to be an advocate. And that includes, you know, kind of a overview of how Congress works, it includes um, how to tell your story. You know, everybody shares their stories and talks to each other about it. And again, I think that's, that's very empowering. Um, 
We have practice meetings, so people sit down in small groups and practice going to a meeting, practice telling their story, um, you know, practice how they're going to interact with other people in the meeting. And so again, I think that the practice element is crucial and something that we help provide when people come to DC for training. And then we also do some training. I think another thing Anhalais mentioned this as well is that social media is a great way to connect with other advocates and it's also a great way to connect with elected officials. And so we do provide some training um, on social media when people come to DC. And, and one of the things that we want to do as an organization is that we would like to, um, in the coming months, provide some of this training to people who may not be able to come to DC because there are people all over the country who are interested in doing this and we, we can't bring them all to DC and nor can everyone make it to DC, but even people who may not um, be very mobile can certainly um, engage on social media, for example. So how did you get into this field? How did you become a full-time advocate? Um, what got you interested in politics? Um, I guess I've always been interested in politics. I grew up in a political family. Um, so I, I've always found it very interesting and I was very fortunate at the beginning of my career that I was able to get a job on Capitol Hill and um, 30 years later, I'm still working in politics, so um, I like it. Uh, it's, uh, it's interesting, sometimes frustrating, but it's a fascinating study in human nature, and I think not just that, but it's, it's a way to um, really affect change, and I, I'm inspired by our patients every single day and feel very fortunate to work at AKF and, and represent and work with the voices of our patients on Capitol Hill and, and also in the, in the state. We're very active at the state level as well. So I have time for one more question that I'd like to ask both of you from maybe sort of both sides, but you know, all, a lot of times advocacy takes work and you have to keep persevering. So I mean, do you ever feel discouraged? And if you do, you know, how do you pick yourself back up and keep going and pushing through? Angelis, would you like to answer that one first? Sure. Um, nothing in life is easy, and it definitely hasn't been easy for me or any patients that have to go through kidney failure. So, you know, sometimes you have to, the best thing you can do is like just to go to sleep and then you wake up and the next day is a new beginning. I kind of use that um, mentality for everything I do in life. Um, you're going to win some and you're going to lose others, but um, if you don't do anything and you stay waiting for someone else to do the work, it's not going to get done. So um, I think that you have to find um, small wings and celebrate them. And um, you have to be prepared to succeed sometimes and, and, and um, to, I think it's, you, you can't succeed if you don't try. And I think somebody famous have said that um, uh, failing is better than not trying, and I and, and I think that 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 applies definitely um, to any advocacy work. Thank you, um, Holly. We have a couple seconds. Sure. I mean, I, I love Annalise's answer. I think that's absolutely right. I mean, there's no way I have been doing this for as long as I have without being discouraged on a regular basis. Um, some years more than most, um, but you just have to keep fighting the good fight, and you you can't give up and sometimes these things just literally take years and it's not always easy to stay committed and focused but if you want to be successful that's what you have to do. Thank you so much. Um, thank you both Holly, thank you Angeles for just all the information that you shared and just your personal stories and experiences with advocacy. It's really, really interesting. So I just wanted to let the audience know our next webinar will be on kidney disease in children and will cover differences between kidney disease in children versus adults and how to manage kidney disease as a child while maintaining a full childhood. The webinar will be held on Tuesday, August 14th and hosted by Dr. Poya Kapam Srivas from Texas Children's Hospital. Registration is now open, so visit kidneyfund.org webinars flash webinars for more information and to register. When the webinar closes, please do not close your browser window. You may see a pop-up saying the webinar is ended.
post that pop-up and proceed to the webinar evaluation survey. Your honest feedback will help us make our webinar program the best it can be. Thank you for joining us. We hope to see you again.